Well, thanks, uh, Sally, for, for such a, a very warm and, and kind in, introduction. And um, I have to say, it really gives me great pleasure to, to join you here um, at Stanford today. Um, and I, I really want to thank Sally and, and the whole team at Stanford for um, the, the invitation um, and, and really for this conference as well, because you are covering the key issues of our time. Um, We've seen great political progress, as we've already heard, over the last year in addressing climate change. And I also want to really recognize the work of uh, Ambassador Tubiana, uh, who played such a leading role last year um, at Le Bourget in, in helping us, uh, as the world, come together to drive a new global climate agreement. Um, as she outlined this morning, the agreement will be formally adopted this week, which she didn't say, but is faster than many had predicted it would be adopted. Um, and it will help guide us in the emissions reductions and deep decarbonization necessary to ensure our planet's path towards a sustainable future. Deep price decreases in renewable energy technologies, again, as we've heard somewhat uh, this morning, especially in solar PV, um, over the last years, is, uh, particularly since 2010, when combined with Make Sense regulatory policy, have already accelerated widespread adoption of renewables, um, not only solar PV, but also wind energy. And indeed, last year in 2015, according to the International Energy Agency, renewables surpassed coal to become the largest source of global electricity capacity. Globally, around 500,000 solar panels were installed every day in 2015. And this year, we've seen some records setting low prices per kilowatt hour at auction for solar PV and onshore wind. According to Bloomberg New Energy Finance, grid-side project agreements have gone as low as 4 cents per kilowatt hour in Peru in February, 2.99 cents per kilowatt hour for solar PV in May in Dubai, and 3 cents per kilowatt hour bid for several wind projects by NL Green Power in Morocco earlier this year as well. Now, those were all several months ago, so by now they may already have been surpassed. But the key question that I want to focus on is, can the market go everywhere? Is it enough? Um, and particularly for developing economies, we cannot only measure progress from the standpoint of rapid price decreases for large-scale grid-side renewable energy projects, providing additional uh, generation capacity into an existing grid, although progress in that is extremely important. Um, in some countries, a large number and sometimes the majority of citizens don't even yet have basic access to electricity. So in terms of the deficit, India actually has the largest number of people, something over 300 million, and, and statistics vary, but about 300 million people living without, uh, without access to electricity. Um, although their current government is very much prioritizing action on access with some very aggressive targets that, um, uh, that they're really trying to, 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 within the next few years, actually bring about universal electrification in India. And, and I'll come back to that uh, shortly. And over 600 million people across sub-Saharan Africa do n also don't have any electricity. Um, in this hemisphere, we're doing better. Uh, the situation's much more advanced. But still, even here in the Americas, about 30 million people don't have access to electricity in their homes and communities. For example, in some parts of Peru and other Andean countries, um, in some parts of southern Mexico even, and uh, one that's near and dear to my heart because I've worked there uh, many times over the years is in Haiti, which actually has the lowest rate of electrification still in the Americas. Now, some of you may be familiar with these figures, but globally, over 1.1 billion people uh, around the world still don't have any electricity, and another billion have only intermittent access. Um, and over and above that, some 2.9 billion, we were hearing about clean fuels this morning, but some 2.9 billion people don't have access to clean, modern cooking fuels. So it's a double whammy. You may not have the electricity, and you also may be relying and dependent on uh, um, traditional biomass um, for, for your cooking as well. So this limits uh, economic development opportunities for the citizenry, um, for 
um, those countries, at both national and local levels. And I just want to say um, for a moment that when we talk about energy access, it can mean different things to different people. When I talk about it with governments, it often, um, they, they're thinking about industrialization, they're thinking about macroeconomic benefits, they're thinking about how they can um, bring more electricity onto existing grids and really help support industrial development. And that's absolutely appropriate. However, when I'm talking about energy access, most generally, I'm talking about it from a human development standpoint, um, in terms of what can be done with power. Um, traditional measures of grid extension really don't also focus on issues around affordability, reliability, quality of the services provided. Um, and so some of the newest ways of measuring energy access actually do uh, bring these in, and the World Bank, um, you can look it up afterwards, but the World Bank has what's called a global tracking framework where they're really looking at tiers of service for energy access for households and communities. So this leads me on to the second area of great progress in the last 18 months, which is the adoption by UN member states of 17 sustainable development goals. These replace the prior millennium development goals um, and their new goals and targets set out a universal framework for international action on development from now until 2030. What is especially notable is that while climate change is included as its own goal, for the first time there is also a specific goal on energy. And believe me, this was not easy to get included in there. Um, for those of you who may have followed the Millennium Development Goals, a lot of people said that the energy issues were kind of the missing Millennium Development Goal. So politically, it was a great win to be able to get to goal number seven, which largely adopts the language of the UN uh, Secretary General's Sustainable Energy for All initiative um, to secure sustainable energy for all and focuses on energy access, efficiency and the deployment of renewable energy with a view to reaching universal access to modern energy services by 2030. And uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has really been a tremendous leader um, in this area in helping to to drive the political momentum needed to, to be able to get this, uh, uh, this goal in place. And, and interestingly, there is also recognition that it's not only a goal about energy, but it's about a goal on energy as it enables other areas of development as well. And I'll, I'll touch on that uh, in just a moment. So there's now clear recognition by policymakers of the development benefits brought by having modern energy access, electrical power, modern cooking and also heating technologies and fuels. And governments, both donor governments and developing country governments, have adopted specific initiatives to address this, although I would say that some need to move further and faster. Um, here, as Sally mentioned in the introduction, in the US, uh, we've really had great leadership through the President Obama's Power Africa initiative, which was launched in 2013, with a goal of 60 million new electricity connections and 30,000 megawatts of new and cleaner power uh, generation. So it's not all renewables, it does include natural gas as well. But it also includes a specific off-grid component called Beyond the Grid that uh, um, I was very much supportive of uh, within the overall initiative that recognized that the that, that grid is not necessarily gonna get us uh, uh, to where we need to go by itself. In developing countries, uh, Bangladesh is a great example of, uh, of leadership where the government some years ago established a special infrastructure funding agency called IDCOL, um, which supports the deployment of solar home systems through the use of partial cost subsidies. And they work with an identified and agreed upon provider network um, around the deployment of these small systems, which are bundled with solar PV, um, basic lighting, um, I think the last I knew, maybe they've gone to color now, but it used to be a black and white TV, and um, other small appliances for unelectrified households. By the end of 2014, more than three and a half uh, million households across Bangladesh had installed these, these solar home systems. So that's been a terrific uh, example of a developing country that has adopted an off-grid solution as part of their suite of, of, of solutions for energy access. But as I already mentioned, change is not happening everywhere fast enough um, 
for the more than billion people who lack energy access. And many do still depend on expensive, and I'm sorry to say it for the speaker who was saying about how fantastic fossil fuels are, but um, for a household, it really is an inferior energy support when that is providing your lighting inside your house because of the emissions, not only, but also because of the black carbon emissions that contribute to indoor air pollution. Um, and they use uh, candles or kerosene to light their homes in the evening. And one of the other challenges as well is, according to researchers, a key source of poisoning for under five-year-old uh, children is actually the ingestion of kerosene. Because if you think about it, it sort of looks like a soft drink. And so, um, unfortunately, it's, it's, a, it's a big poisoning challenge. Not only that, but um, several years ago when I was in Haiti, I visited a pediatric ward in a rural hospital. And um, it was heartbreaking because 80% of the children who were hospitalized there uh, were, were there as a result of burns, um, some of them very extensive over their bodies, from fires that had been caused by knocked over kerosene lanterns and, and candles. And unfortunately, these very human costs of energy poverty are often really not included in uh, um, the healthcare budgets or recognized fully as, as being something that, that requires um, immediate action within, within a healthcare setting. Because for a $10 solar lantern, you could actually be reducing a whole lot of, of, of hospitalizations and, and healthcare costs down the pike. Equally, in some countries, women going to the clinic to give birth, such as in parts of Malawi, are still told to bring a candle with them to help light the birthing center at night because they lack electricity. So childbirth, of course, does not wait until morning. You can't tell a woman to wait to go into labor until she arrives at the district hospital several hours drive away. And for a surgeon to perform an emergency C-section at night clearly also requires power. So the delivery of modern healthcare services particularly, and I'm giving this as an example, which is in S sustainable development goal number three, just to touch on how energy um, really equates with other development benefits. It just can't simply wait for the grid to arrive. Um, so, so rather than just saying, okay, well, these people don't have the grid, that's just too bad, we've really been looking at um, what are the solutions that can be provided um, either instead of or before the grid arrives. And so uh, research has shown that in, in order for us to be able to reach universal electrification um, by 2030, which is the global goal, that about 40% of the solution will come from some sort of uh, grid extension. Um, but the IEA says that about 60% of the solution will come from off-grid solutions which includes either standalone solutions like solar home systems at the household level or some kind of pico, uh, micro, or mini grid, um, but that, that, that may be uh, interoperable with the national grid or it may be uh, installed on a standalone basis. Um, and clearly, renewables are uh, very, very appropriate in these situations. Some microgrids are hybridized, so it can be solar PV with a wind turbine. In this case, this one is in, uh, in uh, Kakabia, in uh, the Blue Lagoon area of eastern Nicaragua, um, in an indigenous Mosquito Indian community. And that wind turbine was powering the health clinic, um, as well as a few households. Um, but but in, in some cases, diesel is, uh, is used in a hybrid uh, situation with renewables. But increasingly, we're seeing renewables really leading um, in this area. Um, so PV particularly is helpful combined with storage, as well as policy and financing innovations. Um, and it's really driving a revolution over the last 10 years in the provision of off-grid energy services. And so solar PV is especially useful in a healthcare context um, because it can be installed very rapidly and flexibly into frontline health clinics with lower operating costs than diesel generators. Even though the diesel genset, the capex, is, is quite low, um, you still have to be able to purchase the fuel. And we found even in some healthcare centers that got uh, diesel generators from the U.S. government to help address the, the need for rapid um, new clinics to deal with the Ebola crisis. Um, so there was a lot of deployment of diesel gensets two years ago. Um, now some of those same clinics, the ones that are still going, have struggled, we've seen, to, to 
keep purchasing the fuel on an ongoing basis. So in the past, the solar, the, the capex was more expensive, but you don't have um, such high operating costs. Um, and, and that has really been a, a, a bit of a game changer for some of these communities. And the World Health Organization has also done studies comparing um, solar PV uh, solutions in health, uh, health clinics compared with diesel gensets. And they've actually said that, that solar has a better performance overall as well. Um, and they're, they're cleaner. So clearly from a WHO perspective, they would rather see us uh, um, producing fewer emissions, particularly in a healthcare setting. An American surgeon I met in Freetown in Sierra Leone who was working in an upcountry clinic told me that his own staff were very skeptical initially about putting in a solar system for their clinic um, because it was located in an area unserved by the national utility. But then they did some research and really looked at the data when they, they catalogued results following installation. And the data showed a steep drop in the following months in maternal and neonatal mortality, so mothers and their newborns, resulting from being able to provide life-saving surgery in the hours from dusk until dawn. So system sizes in these clinics will range from about 1 to 10 kilowatts on average, um, um, usually AC. Um, so you, you've got a system sometimes in, in multiple rooms across the clinic, um, but also um, really focusing on, on the, the birthing area as well uh, in, in, a, in a birthing clinic. Um, one group here in the Bay Area um, that some of you may be familiar called We Care Solar also provides a small plug and play solution that doesn't provide solar PV for the whole clinic, um, but does certainly provide the lighting and um, uh, several uh, um, solutions that, 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 that are required during, during the, the birthing process. Um, and that has been able to be deployed to, to a lot of clinics that are in off-grid areas, and particularly actually as a humanitarian solution as well. Um, for example, in Nepal after the earthquakes there last year. So, so the adoption of SDG 7 on energy, um, and I give the example of health, but I could also talk to you for half an hour here about agriculture or about water, or about many different areas um, that are affected by, by not having uh, sufficient access to electricity. And having electricity also helps people to make a living because they can operate um, small businesses um, uh, and, and it opens up opportunities for them that were not previously available. So I already touched upon solar home systems earlier, and traditionally they were financed using bank credit. And that really is a sea change going on right now in terms of the provision of solar using solar home systems. In the past, the challenge was that, um, first of all, they were unaffordable if you were poor. And about 10 years ago, it was about $600 for a small-scale solar home system. And as we've heard, the costs of the PV have decreased, um, but you still have the challenges around the cost of battery, around the whole system integration, making sure that once you've installed the system, who's going to maintain it, making sure you have the whole supply chain in place for that. So this is, this is uh, a solar system in uh, Karnataka, in, in India, put in place by, uh, by Selco. Um, and here, the consumer, generally speaking, has to provide a down payment. And so if you're very poor, the banks are not going to lend to you because they require a 20% down payment, and you may not have that saved up. So there have been different ways to address that in the past. Um, India has a tremendous tradition of agricultural bank lending, so you can get the credit, um, but they've used donor money in the past to bridge the, the bank loan uh, and, and the offsetting it with, with what was required by the consumer to be, be able to afford the initial down payment and then get the loan, which... Um, generally speaking, needs to be about three to five years long in order to be able to make the payments affordable for, for the household. So Selco has done this very successfully over 20 years. Um, they've been a leader uh, and a real pioneer globally. Um, and, uh, and, and so you could sort of say, well, that's the end of the story. But, but in fact, um, what we've seen just coming in the last really four to five years has been a, a sea change in terms of social entrepreneurs starting, including one uh, in particular, but several that have come out of the Bay Area, 
um, providing a different type of financing. And so it's really not a technology issue that we're talking about. Financing has been a key constraint because of the affordability issue. So um, two, two, two organizations I quickly want to touch upon. Um, before we come back to solar home systems, I just want to touch briefly also on the story that started 10 years ago here at Stanford University. And I was here in, in June and, and mentioned this very briefly, but in a Stanford design class um, called, I think it was Design for the Base of the Pyramid, a grad student back in, in, in late 20, 2006, maybe even early 2007, gave me a call when I was at Good Energies and said, I'm starting this uh, company focusing on small-scale solar lighting because I found that, in fact, kerosene isn't good, candles aren't good, and we want to provide something that's really affordable to the very poor. And that company, uh, which came out of Stanford, design class from the son of a Peace Corps volunteer. His parents were with the Peace Corps, so had traveled around and, and seen some of the energy issues in developing economies, um, and then brought that back with him to his, uh, his grad school class. So that company is D-Light which is a leading um, solar lantern provider, which provides very small entry-level solutions. Um, a lot of these are a watt, two watts, so, um, but combined with LED and lithium-ion, or now actually more lithium-ion phosphate batteries, they provide entry-level lighting at a price point which is way lower than a solar home system. So the entry-level now, um, fast forward, um, D-Light has... Um, sold millions now of, of solar lights alongside other companies like Green Light Planet, which sells um, award-winning lights with cell phone charging capability because people want the cell phone chargers as well as the lighting now. Um, last year, D-Light uh, had a new entry-level uh, light that is affordable at five US dollars. And they have researched and said that that was really, the, the five dollar price point was really sort of, they, they believe, the barrier to, to then mass adoption. Um, and we're seeing very low-cost, battery-powered LED lights coming out of China now. Um, and what we're really looking to do is say, okay, uh, they break, unfortunately, very quickly. So the quality of these solar lanterns has, has gone up enormously. And um, to my mind, uh, um, a $5 solar lantern should be in every child's backpack. So UN agencies that um, provide these nice little backpacks with, uh, for kids going to school with notebooks and things. As far as I'm concerned, they should also, every single one now, contain a, 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 a little solar light so that uh, the children are able to, uh, to read at night and, and do their homework if they want to. Um. Another area, um, since my husband's in the audience and he's a humanitarian, I, I need to touch upon briefly as well, just very quickly, the humanitarian consequences, which is that these portable solutions are especially useful during humanitarian emergencies, um, like the earthquake in, in, in Nepal, like the earthquake uh, six years ago in, in Haiti, where I worked to, to get the first solar lights into the displacement camps because people were living in tents, and uh, when you have lots of tents very close to one another, um, people living um, side by side, unfortunately the risk of fire is, is multiplied. So being able to provide um, non-open flame solutions for their lighting purposes um, while they were displaced was, was, was absolutely critical, um, as well as solar lighting um, for the camps to make sure that women and girls were secure as well. So I'm just going to move on very quickly and, and come back to pay-as-you-go systems because this, this is where I would say, um, I hate to use the word game changer in the Bay Area because um, I think sometimes it is overused, but um, pay-as-you-go is sort of taking the sector by storm now because what they've been able to do is really look at sort of the Uber, the, the combination of Solar City and Uber for the off-grid sector, which is um, they, they, they've looked at, okay, through surveys, how much are households willing to pay? Maybe you're paying five, 10, $15 per month for your kerosene, for your candles. For the same price, um, they are providing you energy as a service. In some companies, you are still over time purchasing the asset. In others, they're saying, okay, you don't have to, it's sort of like a, a nano utility. You don't actually have to own the, the asset. What we want to provide you is the services um, from the energy system. And one of the backbone 
changes that has taken place to enable this has not actually been an energy innovation, but has really been on the, the, the cell phone side of, of the house through um, the adoption of mobile money. And in Kenya, um, there's a mobile money provider called M-Pesa, which really provided the, the infrastructure for people to be able to use their cell phone to pay for small amounts of energy service. So these companies, um, like uh, some of the leaders are Off Grid Electric and Nancy Fund, who is gonna be speaking with you tomorrow, is one of the investors in Off Grid, so she may be able to tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, Mobisol, Mcopa, and, and some others as well have been really working, and Kenya is a leading country um, for this approach, to provide these small-scale solutions. Now, from a business perspective, um, uh, traditionally, again, the renewable energy provider provided the technology, the bank provided the financing. The difference this time is, in one sense, it's riskier because the renewable energy provider, let's say it's a, a Mobisol or, or an Mcopa, is providing the, the asset or the use of the asset, um, but they're also taking the risk on their own balance sheet. What they are hoping to do and what the investor community is, is trying to support them to do is then actually um, offsetting that risk by, by putting it back into the financial markets. And we're still very early stage in, in this. And um, I have to say this with, with some trepidation, having lived through um, the, 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 the real estate uh, collapse in 2008. You know, we want to make sure that, that in fact, uh, um, if there is securitization of these assets, that, that it is uh, a solid um, uh, opportunity for the financial markets to take on. But there have been some encouraging signs. Um, a company called Bbox had the first securitization um, just under a year ago in, in this market. So it really has been looking at affordability. And if you think about it, when you have a customer who has a limited ability to pay, you need to make sure that every watt that you're providing to them or every service is really um, um, affordable for them and in a quality way because they can't pay, afford to pay more than once. If I buy a flashlight, it doesn't work. I buy another flashlight. Um, in, in their case, if they're only making $1.50, $2, $3 per day, that really is, is not a, an affordable um, equation or solution for them. So, so that, that is an area that is extremely exciting and the story has not finished. Um, it's ongoing and uh, as I say, it's really a story of the last three to four years. Kenya is a leader, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda is becoming a leader. Um, not every country has adopted mobile money. So in some countries, they're using scratch cards where you can actually get a code and put it into your cell phone to then pay for your electricity. So the system stops working if you run out of juice, but then you can either text or get a code for your cell phone, and then you can add more um, onto your system. So that really has been a sea change for the provision of energy services for off-grid communities. And then um, before I conclude, the, the other area where there's a lot of focus has been on microgrids. And I would say this is also an evolving area. The solar lanterns were um, a, a volume play that was done largely absent government regulation because it's a consumer product. So you still have the, the, the import duties uh, and so on. But, but actually in terms of the deployment, it was just like any other purchase. Solar home systems, often also um, very loose government regulation. When we get to microgrids, however, the story becomes a lot more complicated from a regulatory standpoint, because in some countries, it's the national utility that still has a monopoly. Um, microgrids may or may not legally actually be able to, allowed to deliver power to their consumers. So there's a lot of interest in this. Um, and when I say microgrid, it can be anything from a pico grid like uh, Devagi, um, uh, provides in Tanzania that, that is really still providing um, very low amounts of, of power to consumers because that's what they can afford at this point. Um, alongside efficient appliances, and I mustn't leave that part out because we are seeing some super efficient appliances now that can deliver um, a 15-inch LED, LED TV um, that's only about 12, 15 watts. So we can do a lot more with a small amount of watts than we could um, even, even five years ago. And uh, DOE has had a, a marvelous program called the Global Lighting and Energy Access Partnership, 
part of the Clean Energy Ministerial. They have competitions every year uh, that has really showcased some of the leading super efficient um, TVs, lights, and then this, this last year, fans as well, um, to show what you can now do even if you have um, very severe constraints on your energy system. So, so just, to, just to wrap up, um, with the microgrids, we are seeing change. We are seeing um, governments now more aggressively including different types of um, off-grid and mini-grid solutions in their energy planning. There are some wrinkles. Um, for example, uh, if the regulatory structure is not really very clear for um, investors, they are not let, they're not really going to want to invest in a microgrid solution because what happens if the grid then comes to that community and you've invested in the microgrid? Do you just lose the value of the asset or is it incorporated into the national grid, which is fine if it's interoperable with the main grid or are the investors compensated for the loss of, of the, the revenue? So there's a lot of wrinkles that are still being worked out. And, um, and at the same time though, there is much more increasing uh, awareness and appreciation of the role that these um, off-grid solutions are able to play um, in terms of helping to address energy access. And I just want to, to, to quickly, um, that's D-Light's uh, lantern, but I just really want to, to end by looking at a little bit where we're going in the future, um, because I think I, I, I talk at these conferences and, and it's all sort of about catch up and it's, it's about sort of, well, we, we're nowhere near where you are, you know, in, in the US, uh, let alone here in the Bay Area. Um, but in some areas, they're actually ahead. So I want to say that Rwanda has already started its first drone service to be able to provide um, medical samples, blood samples, to get them to labs for testing uh, very rapidly. Uh, Mobisol, one of the country, uh, companies that I mentioned, um, also has been uh, exploring the use of solar-powered drones. Um, I know Amazon.com here is still thinking about it. So it's not always about catch-up. Sometimes it is about leapfrogging, not necessarily leapfrogging the grid, but really leapfrogging on the delivery of the service. So I, I want to just... Um, throw out a little challenge to the students who are in the room because um, I have over the last six years had the pleasure of working with five Stanford grad students through the what was then called the MAP Fellows Program. It's now called the Schneider Fellows Program. And I have a 40% track record of the five students who um, I worked with. Um, uh, two of them actually then subsequently when they graduated from Stanford went into um, working on energy access issues. One of them who went to work for a microgrid startup in Indonesia, and the other, Shea Hughes, who is now working with Off-Grid Electric. So um, it's a 40% track record. I would love to see it, um, maybe Sally too, at a 60 or 80%. Um, but that fellowship really was uh, instrumental for me in terms of helping our work at the UN Foundation get going um, in, in, in developing a lot of this programming over the last six years. So I'll finish then. Um, thank you all for, for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, so questions? Okay, we've got one over here. To, to go back to your first slide the, in the, the statement by Ban Ki-moon, mm. uh, what's the energy, what's the, the, the power needed for a typical water pump? That, that's a great question um, because it partly depends on how deep they're pumping the water from. So one of the challenges has been that solar water pumps tend not to be able to go as deep as diesel pumps. Um, so, so they were not always seen to be as um, usable by farmers, in, uh, particularly in, in, in agricultural settings in India. Um, but however, um, one of the challenges has been that um, diesel has been drawing so much water that sometimes it's more than the farmers need and it contributes to the lowering of the water table. So um, I'm not, not answering your question, but I'm answering it in a slightly different way because one of the exciting things in India is that the government has really focused on initiative on bringing solar water pumping much more across the country. 
And they've not only been able to do it to provide the um, limited amounts of water that the farmers need, but they've begun to use it as a source of revenue for some of those farmers because they're able to then provide any excess power provided by the solar panel for that water pump to use it for other services. So that's, that's brand new, and we're sort of still seeing how that plays out, but really trying to look at revenue for, for those farmers. Okay, more questions? Do we have one over there? Okay. Hi. Um, thanks for your presentation. Uh, I know this question is about uh, solar cooktops and displacement of the kerosene with solar cooktops, and I know that idea is been kicking around for, you know, I don't know, at least five years, maybe longer, um, I'm sure. And based on my understanding, the, the microfunding model is sort of a gating factor for the proliferation of those solar cooktops, and we're still not seeing adoption at the levels that we want, primarily because of that factor. But it seems at the same time, with respect to COP21 and the need for developing countries to get funding that, you know, there needs to be more emphasis just on, you know, providing these funding rather than, you know, finding a way for people to come up with 15 or $20 a month to be able to do this um, because of the impact of these, um, of kerosene, you know, even impacts the, the glacial melt in the Himalayas and whatnot. So your thoughts on how we could better, you know, enable that? Um, I, I agree with you. I mean, a lot of the pricing now is, is really re reflecting what customers are already paying. So it's, it's complex because if the grid is coming, then some governments do provide a lifeline tariff for the very poor. So it gives them a certain number of kilowatt hours on a monthly basis. Others will subsidize a grid connection. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about this, which is, is it really ethical for consumers to have to pick up the cost? You know, they're already among the very poorest. Um, and a lot of the companies are really coming uh, at entering it with, with a very much a social mission as well as a commercial mission. Um, I would say the commercial often trails the social. They came out as a social entrepreneur, but they're also trying to make money doing it. Um, so, so I would say, yes, um, clearly money is an issue. And we do, we do recognize, um, depending on whose analysis you, you follow, we need an order of, it's like $9 billion a year on energy access, and we need to have several multiples of that to be able to provide full access. But again, it depends on whether you're talking about grid or whether you're talking about some kind of off-grid solution. With some of the very, um, very low-income consumers, um, they, they may not be able to afford more energy than a, a, a light and a cell phone charger initially. Um, so... They have in the past, um, and one of the reasons I actually moved over from the non-profit sector to the private equity sector and then on the policy side was that um, a lot of the giveaways in the past hadn't actually been very successful of solar home systems and these solutions. Indonesia had, in the late 90s, had given away about a million solar home systems, um, but the challenge was that they hadn't really... Um, work through all of the supply chain issues in terms of the maintenance of those solutions. So coming at it from a full market standpoint, at least we hope bakes in the ongoing maintenance of that solution. So you have back-to-back -back warranties. You make sure you've got professional technicians who are providing service. You increasingly have call centers. Now we are seeing, particularly with some of these pay-as-you-go solutions, that you have um, remote monitoring capability in the actual system itself. So if for some reason you see that the production is, is going down, it may be as simple as texting some, someone to say, have you, have you wiped off your panel recently? But, but, but I completely agree with you on the cooking side. Um, that has been uh, a real challenge, um, partly because, um, um, well, first of all, people are uh, culturally uh, very attuned to cooking in a certain way for the types of food that they're used to eating. Um, second is um, that wood and biomass have been and, and continue to be the, the standard in terms of what's available and what's affordable for, for very poor communities. Um, I've done some work recently with, with an LPG group, that's uh, the Global LPG Partnership, that are really looking at the provision of LPG, which you may say, well, it's a fossil solution, However, it is looking at um, providing LPG in developing countries um, more broadly to help with reducing deforestation issues. 
and it's a clean burning fuel, so it also helps lower the indoor air pollution as well for that household. Um, in terms of cooking, yeah, I mean, induction stoves would be interesting, um, and maybe this is a great Stanford research project because we've struggled as, a, as an industry, as a sector, to really look at a fully renewable cooking solution. So um, perhaps somebody will patent that in, in the next few years and, and we can really take it and run with it and help it to get adopted. Okay, right down there. Uh, wait for the mic. Oh, there's one right behind you. Have you faced any problems with regard to the financial infrastructure in countries like India? Because even the banks that do provide loans for agricultural communities, they fail pretty often. And even when the NABARD like, rescues them, it's like they go under very often. And how do you like uh, overcome the problem of the financial infrastructure to be in place for the agricultural communities? Um, well, I can speak that really to Salco's work, um, which is that they've, they've worked with um, many of the agricultural banks. But what they've done, and I think very successfully, is they've also had banker-to-banker -banker training. Because in Canadica, you know, they've been there for 20 years. People are used to financing um, solar home systems and um, solar, uh, solar for um, small-scale community purposes as well. Um, in some of the other states, they're less familiar with that, and so there may be a resistance because they say, well, I'm not really sure about this solar thing. So they've, had, they've done quite a lot of banker-to-banker -banker training, taking bankers from Connecticut to Bihar. I was involved with, with that a, a couple of years ago. I'm really talking about best practices in lending in this sector. Now, there are, there are um, low interest rates, so it, it is actually, I think it's a 4% interest rate. It is quite um, attractive in many senses, um, and then, but the, the other challenge has not been so much about the banks, but in terms of a sort of forced subsidy, which is that the government has put subsidies into the system, but they haven't always arrived in time. So for a small company, um, you may actually be struggling in terms of your cash position just simply because you've been selling the systems, but the subsidy hasn't actually made it back down to you um, in time. And I know there's been quite a lot of work in, in the last year and a half on, uh, on improving that and making sure that the company doesn't go under by being too successful at selling the subsidized systems. Okay, do we have another question? Um, Okay, oh, there, there's one over there. Okay, yep, so actually we're gonna go over here because I think you've asked a question before and I'm trying to spread it around. So we'll go to you and then I'm gonna ask one quick question at the end. So I need to move to elsewhere in the room if I wanna ask another question. <laughs> oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> That's right. um, is any effort being made to enable the manufacture and service of these products be within country or is it just having them import these being manufactured somewhere else in the world and serviced remotely from elsewhere in the world? That, that's a great question, and I would say yes and no. Um, a number of years ago, when I was still on the private equity side, we were actually looking and saying, well, wouldn't it be great if we had some of these solar um, panel manufacturing facilities in West Africa, because then we could do local production. Um, there's been a bit of a chicken and egg, which is if you don't have power, then you need the power to be able to produce the power. So that's been a constraint for some countries, which is that it just didn't really have the infrastructure to be able to have that manufacturing in country. Second is, um, as we've heard, you know, it's really a China play now. I mean, First Solar is one of the few non-China companies that has, has been able to be uh, successful over a longer term until now. So, so the costs have come down so much that um, while some governments are saying, you know, we really should be getting in this game and, and producing it locally, I think on the assembly side, for some of the components and the system integration, absolutely. But in terms of the solar panels, it's, it's commoditized now. So I don't really think from a cost perspective that um, there's necessarily going to be any um, additional value. Um, what we have, have been looking at, though, is, is really trying to um, support the local economy in the sales um, in the sales piece of the whole supply chain, which is uh, an, a number of groups have been particularly looking at women entrepreneurs and um, sort of like the Avon model, which is uh, local community women entrepreneurs selling um, suite of, of solar and cooking products to their particular communities, either as a main source of income or as a supplementary source of income. And so I think that's more is, is sort of looking at that local 
economic development and, and building that local entrepreneurship is the way that the sector has been moving more than really sort of trying to say, well, we're going to try and compete head on with the Chinese because I just don't, I just don't see that that would be viable at, at this stage. Okay, so last question from me. So when we think about energy access, you know, electricity always comes up and clean cooking fuels come up. But what about um, mobility access? You know, because, you know, and then in many parts of the world, you still see animals being used as a primary mode of transport. And, you know, that brings a whole set of challenges. And, yeah, so is there much thought on mobility access as part of this larger set of issues around energy access? Um, well, as, as our, as our um, distinguished speaker from GM was speaking this morning, I was thinking exactly that. You know, so why don't we get a, a Lyft or an Uber that, that can service some of these remote communities? Because... Um, if you're paying for the service rather than paying for the, the asset, you know, then it becomes much more affordable. So, um, but it tends to be an urban um, infrastructure rather than a, a rural because of the dispersion of, of some of the communities. Um, but I think it's a great question. And in some countries, um, they are already looking at this in terms of the, the EVs for, for public transportation. So I know Kenya, I believe in Nairobi there, um, beginning to replace our existing matatus, which are the sort of the minibuses that are the public transport in the city with um, electric matatus. Um, in some parts of Asia, I believe that there are um, electric uh, rickshaws. Um, you know, there, there is work. I haven't personally been so involved in the transportation solutions, but you're absolutely right, and there needs to be a lot of, a lot of uh, additional work on that area. And hopefully GM can help us lead on that. Okay, so you've heard lots of challenges for the students. So uh, anyway, we're looking forward to hearing your good ideas. Uh, if you've got them and you want some help with pursuing those, you know, come let us know. So thank you very, very much for the outstanding talk. Thank you.